Some people can be under intense heat because he's preeminent in their life. He's, he's the one that administers government over their lives. The things that you find them doing, it came from him. These are instructions he gave and they are following, they are, they are prosecuting those instructions. You will find his glory on those people. They will know when things, when policies, new policies are released in the heavenlies because they are close to him. They are around the administration of our civilization. And there are some other guys that, you know, they just come to church because we are Christians. They, you know, they are, they are participants in the Christian religion. So on Sunday morning, they have a bow tie and they sing hymns. <laughs> you might be minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit because you are so far away from the heart of our civilization. And that's what I got. The understanding I got from what you said. So where are you in the orbit? Are you Pluto? In the distant corridors of the outer court. And the impact of the blazing sun does not get to where you are. So there's coldness around your space. No heat, no fire. You have found a way to exist apart from the government of the Christ. So your life is a product of your wisdom. You don't need him in your circumference. But there are some men that can do nothing of themselves. But they want to hear his voice before they act. They want to see his face before they move. Those ones are living under the direct implication of his administration. And his government is heavy upon their heart. When they cry, heaven, half of heaven can move. To provide what is needed through that office to meet the need for which they cry. And that's the reason why our prayer ladders were on different frames of reference on the prayer ladder. Some people's prayer can liberate Manchester. Some others may pray for 20 years and the demons will still hold. But tonight we wonder under the canopy of his administration. We wander into that place where his voice is law. We go into that corridor where it is only by his spirit. Men rise. That's what the nations of the earth need. Men that are situated directly under the influence of his government. Of ye, of him are ye in Christ Jesus. And in that administrative ecosystem, he can make Christ Jesus to become everything you need just in case you begin to draw close and you find out that you don't have the capacity to sustain prayer. You desire to pray, but the ability to pray is not in you and you are in that struggle. Oh, then it means there is an aspect of Christ that you qualify to receive revelation about. Christ as the quickening spirit. Christ as the resurrection and the life. But the Bible says it's the spirit that quickens it. Christ becomes the quickening spirit to make you alive so that you cannot breathe in such a way that you have vocabulary to communicate to God. In the realm of the spirit, we are totally incapacitated. I know you might be a professor in your field, highly respected in England, in the United Kingdom, but you know what? The fact that you are intelligent and they are, you are revered as a scholar in your field does not give you any advantage in the spirit. In fact, you will need to die to your scholarship in order for your heart to be ready to receive help from God. Because the Bible says it's the spirit that quickens. The flesh, it profits nothing. Your prayer journey becomes an adventure of grace when you realize that you have infirmities. The Bible reveals that the spirit helps our infirmities. And infirmities is in the plural. It means there are many. I'm a bag of infirmities. And you know in, the, in, 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 in ancient English, the word infirmity is also the word for sickness. So according to the Bible, we are all sick. And we are badly sick with diverse infirmities. 
and only the Holy Ghost can cure us. It is the Spirit. It is Christ as the Spirit that administers cure to our insufficiencies and bring us to places where we can operate in the realm of God. So there is a system that is available in the Spirit. But as bogus, as mighty as that system is, it, it, it can elude you if your heart is not aligned to receive help. Before prayer becomes a, a practice, it is first a state of heart. An angulation that must be achieved over and against the influence of the governing canopy, which is the office of Christ. That's where the spirit is released from. That's where grace comes from. That's what we call the throne of grace. You know, you, you, may, you may have understood grace, but many of us do not understand that it is administered from a throne. There's an administration around grace. A throne that manages it. And so many believers are without grace. Without grace in many things. If you find grace, it means you have found Christ. You have found the administrator. He's the source of it. It's when he approves that he releases it through his spirit to begin to manifest in your life. And until you acknowledge that you are incapacitated, you are not a candidate for the Lord's help. You need to be helped to pray. You can gossip all night and describe people's head, that this head is big, and you describe it all night, but you will need grace to talk to a spirit. You can talk to men naturally, but only, it's only by grace you will talk to a spirit. So if you are going to move from the natural realm into the supernatural, you are going to need to salute a chieftain and his name is Jesus and he administers the office of the Christ. Your heart must know this. So when you are blowing away in prayer, it is because you are in search of the administrator. Until you find the grace he administers, you cannot mount up with wings like eagles. You will pray and still be in this hall and some others will pray and mount up into the heavens above. They will see his shape because he will allow them see through his spirit and they will see his shape. He will allow them hear through his spirit so they will hear his voice. And prayer becomes an interaction. It becomes an adventure. It becomes something you want to give yourself to forever because you are exploring the realm of the merchandise of life. So Matt Williams was asking in the orbit where are you with respect to the sun? Are you in the cold places of Pluto? You can migrate tonight. My adventure in prayer began because of my impediment, my speech impediment. I was born with a terrible stammering infirmity. And I had an encounter with God and God revealed to me that I was born to be a preacher. And I was wondering how a preacher could be a stammerer because I could not speak. So God started my journey with an infirmity that I did not have the capacity. There was no drug, no injection I could take that could help my speech impediment. I needed God. So he helped me by allowing me to have a limitation that doctors could not help, could not, my parents' counsel couldn't help. I only needed God. Are you with me? And when I pray, he insists that I'm a preacher. So one day I had time. It's all right, let me find you. And I lay on the altar fasting. Pray. Fasting. Then I had an encounter. A scripture was, was placed on my spirit, man. That was the beginning. The Christ was beginning to administer something. And there was a wisdom that I had to know. So he laid the scripture upon my heart. He said, think through this scripture. Think through this scripture. Are you with me? Have you ever had the experience before you were just praying and the scripture just alights on your heart? Mm, you're already in, interfacing with the administrator. There is a wisdom that you need that is captured in that scripture in order for you to penetrate. Oh! The moment you come into the first field of his influence, he begins to teach you because you need alignment. He needs to take you from where you are in the corridor and bring you under Shekinah illumination. 
swing. He reaches out and drops a scripture on your heart. For me, the scripture he dropped was, as for you, this is the covenant I have with you. I have put my words in your mouth. I said, oh. He has a covenant with me. I was revealing. And he, it is his responsibility to put his words in my mouth. That's great. So if he's the one putting the words in my mouth, it's no longer my responsibility to find out how to speak. He will, he will make sure I speak it. So I now realize that in order for me to preach, I need to go before him and, and find words from words. Once I get words from him, the ability to preach comes with the words he gives. And that's how I can preach on the pulpit. The symptoms of stammering will come back the moment I come in. So I know, I know that there is an administrator that is stronger than my speech impediment. So there is no limitation that you have on your life right now that he doesn't have an administrative response to it. Everything that the father wants to make available to you is under his hand in his administration. But first of all, you need to accept his government. The meaning of my life is what he says to me. That's life for me. I was telling some of our friends this morning, we were in a little Bible study session this morning. I was telling uh, our friends that I was in the oil industry in my country. And you need to be very intelligent and very, very favored for you to have the kind of job that I have. The oil industry accounts for 97% of our gross domestic product. And the kind of salary, we, the philosophy behind our payment system in Nigeria is that you are paid consistent to the performance of the industry that you find yourself. So being that the oil industry is the highest in the ladder, we were paid more than any other worker in the country. And I was good at what I did. I grew in the ranks. It was just two weeks to the time of the examination that will usher me into management cadre. And my Lord came and said, you need to drop your letter of resignation because it's time for you to be a full-blown missionary to take my counsel to the nations of the world. And I told him, I said, is it not to your glory for a manager to resign and say he wants to follow you. Just allow me sit there for one day and I'll go. A manager. <laughs> and the reason why I was appealing the instruction was because if you, if you retire as a manager, the, your, your retirement package is, is large. It's what? Jesus. You need a manager on your team. Say, I'm, <laughs> oh, hallelujah. He said, now, you have to stop it. So the meaning of my life in this stage of my life is that he said I should resign and go to the nations of the world and proclaim his majesty. That is my preoccupation. Do you understand that? It is his throne that gives me essence, relevance. Because the Bible says that he created, all things were created by him and for him. So you exist for him. Most of us are still existing for ourselves and that's why you are weak and powerless. That's why you are still in Pluto. Minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Some others have migrated. Some others like the fires of his presence and the impact of his government. When I left that place, my colleagues say, oh, the witches that have been looking for this boy, they have finally succeeded on his life. We always knew witches were looking for him to, do, to bring injury to his destiny. Now we have confirmed it. And I didn't have any opportunity to explain. Imagine how it would look like among my family members. Imagine, imagine. And there were so many people that, were, that I was sponsoring to school. Those ones didn't have the courage to come and tell me that 
how are we going to <laughs> how are we going to manage the affairs I knew people didn't believe that Jesus spoke to me but that was not relevant because it was Jesus that took me from the wilderness from the backside of the wilderness and he guided me he spoke about the job on the 13th day of when he sent and that was the first time I saw an angel in my life 13th day of uh, January 2003, he sent an angel to me at, at 11.45 p.m. Nigerian time. He said, you will not go into full-time ministry. I will give you a job and you will invest in many destinies and a great network will be formed. That was the day I, I received that. And so I was investing in many destinies according to the instruction. And then he came again and said, I've come to set you free. 16th of August 2019 I've come to set you free so that where I am there also will my servant be so I had to ask him am I bound he said your job is your bondage now it is time for you to go to the nations of the world and I'll send you to the United Kingdom I'll send you to Ghana and I'll send you to South Africa I am here today because one of your sons came to us I'm not a Pentecostal tongue-talking Christian because of Pentecost. I'm not a Pentecostal tongue-talking Christian because of Azusa. I am a Pentecostal tongue-talking, demon-casting Christian because there was a man called Pai Elton, one of your sons that came to our shores. He brought Jesus. And that's why we're here today on the soil of the United Kingdom. To bring Jesus back. Because since our ancestor, Pai Elton, brought Jesus, he brought the character of Jesus, he brought, he brought the power of Jesus. So we could do no less. So I had to resign my appointment. Because Jesus, the administrator, he says so. Because we were created by him. We were created, what? For him. And it was the design of the father. In the chapter of the eternal purpose that he should be preeminent in all things. So the question is, is he preeminent in your life? Is the extent to which he has found his place of preeminence in your life that will characterize the potency of your prayer? There is an angulation, there is an alignment of the heart to that office that is in the spirit in order to bring the dimensions of God down. I think this is the lesson for the night. So we need to go into practicals. How to set your heart to his throne because the bible says that we should come boldly to the throne of grace to the place where grace is administered it's an invitation to everyone that is in christ jesus come boldly come boldly do you come do you respond to the invitation on a daily basis come boldly so we want to go to the throne of grace that place where grace is found. That is the place where things that are about to die revive. That is the place where things that are lost are found. That is the place where things that are taken can be restored. I know that place. It's a place where my weakness is swallowed. My fears are swallowed. And the spirit of faith comes upon my heart. That is a place where my weakness is taken away and it is exchanged for the spirit of power. Oh, if you know the place I speak of, there is nothing that is left for you to fear. I need to tell you my story before we round up. We went to a remote place to preach the gospel. So we put 5 p.m. on the publicity material. Meanwhile, the guys are farmers. It doesn't matter what is on your poster, on your flyer. They will start coming by seven. Whether you put five o'clock, three o'clock, that's for you. They'll go to farm first. <laughs> so they, they all went to farm. And when they came back from the farm, there's something called pounded yam. Do you know yam here? Yam. Do you know yam? My white brothers, you, you know yam. 
So there's a delicacy we call pounded yam. That's the real food from where I'm coming from, not mushrooms. I, just, I saw mushrooms and all. I had to pray. I said, Lord, help me. So I, I've not been in touch with pounded yam for some time since I came on this mission field. And if you are from Africa and you have not had pounded yam, you have not eaten. So for all the days I've been here, I've not eaten. So these guys will go to the farm, come back from the farm, pound, pounded yam, and eat with okra soup. You, you know okra? Yes. And when you eat that, after laboring on the farm, you will sleep first. And then when they recover themselves from sleep, they will now say, we are hearing some sound. <laughs> so, we prayed. We started opening prayer by five, and we prayed. And they were not coming. So I told my tour guide, I have a leading. Let's visit the shrine of the village. Meanwhile, don't do what I did. I was late. All right? Don't just wake up and get excited. Yeah? So it was not excitement. I was led to visit the shrine. And the shrine is where the strong man of the land is. The one that sacrifices blood to the 22 altars of the community. The most dreaded individual among men. And the Lord said, pay him a visit. So I told the, my tall guy, do you know where the shrine is? The local, the shrine of the community. He said, yes, I was born here. Okay, let's visit the place. And when we were approaching, the guy had the priest. He was 100 years old as at the time I met him. I was 36 then. Okay, I was 36 years old then. It's a long time ago. He was a hundred years and he had given blood to all the altars and the spirits were excited and normally if they accept his offering they give him a song to sing a song that is inspired by the demons and so that song was on his lips when we were when we were coming it means the spirits were agitated they were excited at the offerings and we were marching towards the the place and the man got interested he turned around and said hey who are you? Because he wasn't respecting anybody. He was most feared. Nobody visits, visits him. If you have someone that has problems, has trouble, you have someone that's mad, you want him to minister to the mad person, there is this unexplainable kind of sickness and, you know, that kind of stuff. So he, he saw we were healthy. We didn't need his help. So he asked us, Hey, who are you? And I told my interpreter, tell him, we have come in peace. He looked at us with suspicion. Peace. Only for him to realize that the spirits that were following him from the shrine had left. Upon our arrival, he wasn't as strong as he was when he was singing. And he, he tried to threaten us. That is, and I told him clearly, if you don't put that your hand down, I will curse it and it will wither. So he, he looked for a, a smart way. I don't know how, it's one way. And he, <laughs> <laughs> he brought the hand down. He brought the hand down. Meanwhile, as, as all of these things were going on, I was connecting with Jesus. I said, can you reveal something about this man? And he told me, he has a chest condition that is 13 years old, chest pain. I said, oh, the demons you said, they were not able to heal you of your chest pain that is 13 years old. He said, you need a seat. <laughs> so, we, so we sat down. And I was, I opened the scripture and began to talk to him. And then the nine elders that support him in his priesthood, old men with walking stick, they now came into the place. So I began to talk to them. My interpreter was interpreting. It was like for 30 minutes, 30 minutes and they accepted Jesus Christ and, and I insisted I insisted that they, they should kneel down to accept Jesus so they were kneeling accepted Jesus I asked them to, for, to renounce the spirits of the altar and they did and I prayed for them and blessed them and prayed for his chest pain and God healed him then I left him then we came down from the mountain top 
By the time we got down from the mountaintop, the people started attending. The people had slept, eaten pounded yam, okra soup, and now they were on the crusade ground. It was about 10 p.m. in the night. And when we came to the crusade ground, the witches in the territory never knew that the um, mast, which was the altar, was no longer powerful. They didn't know that. During the praise and worship, people that were crippled started standing up from wheelchairs. No preacher, no preacher on the pulpit. A man close to me stood up and he could not believe that he was, was his legs. So he, he touched them. If he wants to look at me, I will remove because I don't know anything. There were three people that rose up from their wheelchairs without a preacher. By the time I came, my job was simple. There was already evidence on ground that Jesus could heal. Three plus ten. Okay, ten other crippled people walked. So when the witches saw that uh, the people that they had afflicted were walking free of affliction, they ran away from the crusade ground. We left our Bibles on the pulpit and we followed after them. The deliverance continued till like 2 a.m. Yes. By 3 a.m. in the morning, the, the village was free of satanic power. <laughs> and that was not because we were strong. That was because we aligned to the source of power. You will live a small life if you don't know the office of this great Christ. For the Bible says, of the Father are ye in Christ Jesus. He is the fulcrum of our civilization. That's New Testament believers. He's the one that has everything that the Father wants to give us in custody. So he is designed to be the most important personality in our lives. God himself has ordained that he should be preeminent. Oh my God. You know, an ordinary believer is different from a forgiving believer. You know that? You also know, do you also know that an ordinary believer is different from a consecrated believer? A, a believer that has come to understand that the meaning of my life is Christ. So I submit to his authority completely. From henceforth, he will stir my life in the direction of his pleasing. That's what makes you close to him. And when you cry, he will come and find out what, what troubles you.